So just a quick note, when the uh, presenters are speaking, and I'm frantically running around to get you a mic, it's mostly for the people who aren't in the theater. So it's really nice when there's interaction, but if you just yell out loud, the people who are watching from home, um, and the few of you who are watching from here, who may be deaf, uh, they, they can't participate as well. So just throw your hand up, I will run to you, I'm pretty fast, or Jolene will run to you, or Hatem, if he joins the crew again, will run to you, someone will run to you, so. And one other note, um, there will be some lightning talks tomorrow. Those slots are filling up extremely quick. And I heard that some people were contacting Andre and Walter about a lightning uh, talk spot. Please come, just find me, grab me, and we'll figure out how to fit you in if you want to give a lightning talk. I learned for the first time today that there's a name, Razvan, which is a very unique name for me. And now I'm actually surrounded by not one, but two Razvans. You got to use, I just got done talking about microphone. Razvans do not listen at all. <laughs> all right, so at least these two don't. But anyways, I'll let Razvan introduce Razvan, and uh, let's leave and it at that. It. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Razvan. Uh, well, you already heard of that. Uh, I supervise the collaboration between the D Foundation and um, University of Polytina Bucharest, uh, where I'm from. Uh, there are a lot of Rosvans out there, so apart from me and Rosvan, there's also Alex, who's also in Rosvan, and kind of the kickoff for this collaboration is another Rosvan that Andre knows about. Um, and uh, for you, it would be very easy to know me because I'm Rosvan D. You may know of D, there's, there's some sort of programming language you may be aware of. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing it's going to be the first, uh, the first programming language in the world in what is about that, Andre? Three years, five years? Two. two years. So in two years from now, D will run the, will be the number one programming line. So that's me, Razvan D. Uh, so with Andre's uh, help, uh, starting from October uh, 2016, uh, we have four master's students from University of Politica of Bucharest who are actively engaged in the uh, D community project. Uh, it's funny because Andre is, uh, the way this started is that Andre is also, uh, his alma mater is actually U University of Politica of Bucharest. Uh, he did not the faculty, however, nobody's perfect. Um, but uh, he's, uh, he's very supportive, and with his help, we've, uh, we've made a lot of progress during the past uh, six months uh, with these four students. So this is Razvan. He's going to be talking about uh, a compiler library. Then uh, next, it will be Lucia with a generic uh, runtime library. Then Eddie and Alex will, uh, will join them tomorrow. Uh, they are still in the beginning, but we are very happy with the way uh, things are progressing. And I had a discussion with Andre uh, yesterday, uh, and we hope to increase uh, this, uh, the team, the local community, to about six or eight uh, students next year. Uh, so uh, we are waiting for your input, and hopefully uh, this kind of experience uh, this, is, this is today may, may be, I know, um, a precedent for further collaboration between the D foundations and then universities. Uh, thank you very much. It's been very exciting for us, and I'll let Razvan uh, kick off the presentation. Thank you, Razvan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to have a presentation about uh, the D language compiler as a library. So, language adoption depends on time to market metric. I'm guessing that's no surprise to anyone. Programmers always want to uh, prefer easy to debug languages, easy to code, easy to learn, easy to everything. And uh, the truth is that development tools greatly decrease time to market. And having a compiler library encourages tool development. The compiler is open source, so why not just hack and slash the code you need? Some uh, cowboy coders might say. Um, well, let's just take a simple example and see what uh, what, what we have to do uh, to do that. So if you want to create a simple tool to print all the imports, we basically have the following options. We can either mess with the compiler code and uh, do what we want. We can implement a visitor, or we can start from scratch. I don't know, build a library or do whatever. So let's see solution one, compiler surgery. So you search for the code that you want, and you add a print there. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, the fact is that this is an inelegant solution, and it might be time consuming if you're not familiar with the code base. 
uh, in our example, where the tool where we print all imports, this is the import AST node. And as you can see, this is the printing part. It's almost half of the code. If we want to, let's say, do another tool which uses imports, then if we add the same amount of co code as this, we end up having more code that does tooling, that code that, that is actually used in the compilation, this constructor. Solution two is to implement a visitor. Uh, the compiler has uh, a basic visitor implemented. And as you can see, it's pretty dumb. It only implements visit methods for all the, the import node. And it, it, it kind of mimics uh, the inheritance, uh, the, the AST inheritance chain. So what you would have to do in our example is to uh, inherit that class and override the methods you need. For example, oh, sorry. For example, you would have to imp uh, override the visit node and then start overriding all the nodes from all the path to import nodes. So you start with module, and then if you want imports from uh, top-level function declarations, you override that one, and class declarations, and so on and so forth. Uh, this solution is more elegant, but the fact is that you, override, you end up overriding a lot of code. And also, it requires a DAST organization. Bottom line, all the approaches are time consuming. You have to have in-depth knowledge of the compiler, and you have no flexibility. No matter what tool you want to import, you end up uh, with, with basically the same options. So let's talk a bit about our approach. At this point, the compiler is organized as a monolithic compiler. Uh, this is just the front-end compiler. I didn't add the back-end code generation, so because I kind of see that as a separate phase. So uh, the idea is to kind of apply a divide and conquer strategy in which we divide the compiler into separate phases, lexing, parsing, and semantics, uh, and offer it as a whole. So let's start with the lexer. This is pretty simple. We need to get all the lexer files and build them as a standalone library. Since the lexer has sparse dependency, this was pretty trivial. This was actually all the code I had to add in, in the make file. These are all the dependencies for the lexers, and these are other dependencies from the root subpath. Mm -hmm. And now, let's go to the parser. This is how the parser is organized. We have a parsing class, which depends on a lot of AST nodes, uh, expression, state, mon, and so on, so for those generic AST nodes. And an AST node uh, stores parsing information and also semantic information. And this is a problem because you end up depending on 95% of the front-end compiler code, which is bad. You can't just get all those sources together and ship up compile the whole compiler and say, hey, here's your parsing library. Uh, talk about tightly coupling. And how do we break these dependencies? The answer is that we template the, the parser. So if that, that was our previous organization, we template the class. We, we template the parser class, and we gather together all the AST nodes in the form of an AST family. And as you can see, at the start, we had multiple dependencies, and we end up having a single dependency to a, to a parser family. This is pretty good since we can, we can instantiate the parser with our current AST family, which is called AST code gen. And we only have to move all the imports from the, parser with, from the file which implements the parser to another file, which is called AST code gen. So I, I, in reality, it's called AST code gen, but I put AST default because it's more expressive like this. So what are the pros, pros to this uh, approach? Uh, the parser is independent because you can instantiate it with whatever uh, AST family we want. It's a non-disruptive change uh, because you have zero overhead. You instantiate with the code. You instantiate the parser with the code which is already in there. Uh, the library and the compiler share this, uh, the same code, which is cool because if you want to change the language, then uh, you don't have to go and change the library also. And it offers you flexibility since you can create uh, any AST family you want. Now let's talk a bit about the cons. <laughs> I couldn't find any, so if, if you find your, you can come and tell me. Uh, the thing is that at the start, uh, if you remember the example with our top level, with our uh, imports, we had to overwrite a lot of methods. 
well, now since we templated the parser, we have to create a new ASP family, and we ended up, you know, creating the nodes, not overriding them. So in order for the, the library to be effective, we have to, to offer some families. And one of them is ASC null. This is basically an ASC family that does nothing and serves up as guidance for, for future, user, future tool developers to define new ASC families. And it's also ASC base, which stores the parsing information. Uh, for example, ASC null looks something like this where I took a random, a random AST node. You can see that uh, all the arguments are templated. You don't care about the arguments. You don't do nothing. You, you don't store nothing AST null. It's like parsing and throwing all the information to dev null. On the other hand, AST base defines all functions and variables and stores parsing information. And by comparison, it looks something like this. As you can see, we're storing some tokens. We're storing the statement. And in the constructor, we're, we're storing some that information. You might have noticed that we also have an accept method, which implies a visitor. Now that we have AST base, which decouples the parsing from the semantics because we have only the, the parsing information, we can define a visitor interface with which we can visit our nodes. So we have the basic visitor, which is practically the same, the same vi visitor from the compiler. This is a private one. You're not going to use it as a tool developer. But we also define uh, three visitors, each one being tailored to some needs. For example, the strict visitor is one that uh, all the overrides assert zero. So you want to use this one when you are sure that you want to pass to traverse the whole SAT. And if you forgot, for example, to override one method, when you parse a file, and let's say you forgot to override error statement and then you have error statement somewhere in your code, then it's not going to work. You're, you're going to hit an assert zero, and that's that. Uh, the second one is permissive visitor. This, yeah. Is that working? Yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, in the standard library, there is the notion of black hole and white hole uh, that you can template on the class. And it seems like it's doing that already or something similar. So I wanted to ask, like, did you try that or, or Sorry. Like, was it working? There is, um, I don't remember in, in which module, but in, this, uh, in type counts, there is uh, two classes uh, called black hole and white hole that essentially uh, you can inherit from a class and it's going to write all the method with uh, either an error or something that does nothing. Um, and it seems like very similar to what you're trying to do here, so I wanted to know, but apparently you don't know about it, so that's... Okay, it. okay, sorry, I don't know anything about black hole or white hole or the thing you are talking about. I guess I have to see the code and... Yeah, uh, you should look at it because it seems like either you should like backport part of that into the black hole and white hole or just use it. The thing is that uh, with, with these visitors and uh, decoupling the parser, we want to have the same code for the compiler and the library. And from what I've seen, there's no use of, of Phobos in the compiler. Yeah, yeah, right. That's what I want to say. We can't use Phobos currently, so we can't use black hole or white hole. Um, OK, so I was saying that permissive visitor is quite the opposite of, um, of strict visitor. You can use it, and you can just not override any single method, and it will work. Uh, this is used, for example, when uh, you want, for the import example, if you want to print just the top level imports, maybe you don't care of some nodes. For example, expression. Let's say you can't have an import in an expression, so you're just going to implement the, A, the, the AST visiting logic. Uh, you start with module, and you accept all the, uh, each member, and once you hit an import, boom, top level import. If it's anything else, a function declaration or a class declaration, you just don't care, and permissive visitor is going to let you do that. Um, the final visitor is transitive visitor. This is the smartest visitor because it implements the AST traversal logic. For example, if you want to print all imports, um, 
we don't want to implement to overwrite all the methods from all the paths to imports. We just want to to overwrite the, imp the import visiting methods, and this is easier because you don't have to know anything about the AST. For example, if you want to, let's say, uh, output all the variable declarations for your program, no matter the, the scope, uh, you're just going to overwrite the visit var declaration, and there you have it. Very easy. Um, also, there's an alternative parcel library. It's called libdparse, and is implemented by Brian Schott. It also has a visitor interface, but uh, I'm not aware of him having a larger range of visitors. It just has one, one basic visitor. It was built from, from scratch, which is a problem, because if the language suffers any problems, then you have to go and modify the library as well. And it has no semantic analysis whatsoever. So uh, the next step is to um, try and <coughs> create the semantics library. Uh, and this is a future work. It's going to tackle version expansion, uh, full name lookup, template instantiation, static if evaluation, mixing expansions, and so on and so forth. Uh, the current status is that we have the Lexer library. We have the parser library, uh, except for the transitive visitor, which is a work in progress. And then we're going to tackle semantics and finally code gen. So conclusions, compiler library is going to make like easier for everyone, for tool developers. Um, it offers a flexible visitor interface. We're 1% there. <laughs> and uh, creating a semantic and code gen is going to be awesome, but it's also going to involve a lot of effort, especially reviewing effort. So anyone who can share some effort, you're welcome. And that was it. If you have any other questions. We have a question from Johan here in the back. Uh, about these visitors that you implemented, what is the, actually in LDC we, all, we also implement a few visitors. And what has been very useful is a recursive visitor that um, you can, so you override uh, uh, specific nodes like this transitive visitor that you have, right? But then uh, that you can decide within this, uh, this over, override whether you continue recursing down the tree um, or not. And this is actually very useful. And to kind of, uh, this ID came from Clang LLVM's visitors. Uh, you may want to have a look at them. OK, thank you for the tip. Got a question from Stefan on the, on the side. OK, thanks. Uh, so actually, Johan, we do have this thing in uh, DMD already. It's the stoppable visitor, which will allow you to stop on a condition. And yeah, I think this transitive visitor is a really great work. And uh, it would be great if it could take like a delicate later on so you just can like just selectively run it on a certain nodes. Uh, yeah, I think that there's a lot of wind there and <coughs> making the compiler uh, more flexible, more m manageable is a wonderful effort. If you have uh, any problems or questions, you can always uh, drop me an email because I work a lot of DMD and I can tell you about the internals. Okay, thank you. We have time for one more. Yeah. Um, how will this interact with, so, so for decompute, I'm, I've put in an extra semantic pass at the end of so semantic one, two, three, and then we've got, um, I've got one for that and we'll also be adding some more for LDC. So how, how, does, how will that interoperate with the, um, the, the, um, the, the, the library that we're putting together. Uh, sorry, could you please repeat the So we, we have extra semantic passes, uh, semantic analysis passes for LDC. How will that interoperate with um, the library that you, uh, the separating out of the library? Well, this is just the parsing library at this point. I haven't done any work on the semantic library, so right. uh, it's premature to answer that question now. All right. Thanks, Razvan. Thank you.
We have one more short talk from someone not named Rosvan, but we'll take a quick break to set that up, and then afterwards we'll have a panel from some other people also not named Rosvan. <laughs> <laughs> See you back in five minutes. <laughs>